Right, now let's see if the technology actually performs, yes. So <clears throat> I thought to introduce uh, the colloquium this morning by just giving you a quick update about what's been happening here at Surrey. Um, at Surrey, we really are focusing on totally on small satellite uh, techniques, applications and uh, business. So today I will give you a quick overview of what we're doing. So if we look at space at Surrey, it's really a combination of academic research and commercial enterprise by people, and if you talk to them, and Susan's here in the audience, and uh, Lloyd, and there'll be a few others from Surrey joining, uh, by people who are really passionate about space. We're all here because we are really enthusiastic about all aspects of space. Of course, we have to earn our keep, otherwise we can't pay for our hobby, if you put it that way. So. Uh, Whilst we undertake academic research and commercial activities, it's all by people who are highly motivated uh, in space. And our whole objective is to achieve more with less. And I guess that's almost the byline of uh, small satellites. Now, those of you that will have visited us over many years, <coughs> we used to hold the colloquium on the university campus, uh, just adjacent to the Surrey Space Centre. And so that's part of our activity. Uh, we have now just under 100 academic researchers who are all looking at the future of space technology and applications, various engineering and uh, applications techniques, as well as providing uh, training <coughs> in, uh, at Masters or PhD level. So essentially, the Surrey Space Centre undertakes research and uh, educational small sat missions. And now, as you will learn, we have moved, SSTL has moved out completely from the campus and moved just down the road here, down the hill, into uh, uh, Tycho House a few years ago, and now just uh, a beautiful new building, which, um, depending on numbers, we might be able to give you an opportunity later to have a look around. So the, <coughs> the campus building has now been vacated by SSTL and the clean rooms handed over or will be shortly handed over to the Surrey Space Centre where we can now start to focus on some interesting research missions and I'll give you some examples of that alongside SSTL's activities. So the other half is uh, SSTL or Surrey Satellite Technology Limited. <coughs> this was, as many of you will know, a spin out from the university uh, formed in 1985. It's now owned by EADS but uh, we operate independently. They are, I like to think of them as our rich parents, uh, so that uh, if we need greater financial resources than the company itself has, we can uh, uh, lean on them a little bit. And uh, <clears throat> the facilities that you see here are only part of what we do. So the headquarters is here at Guildford, Tycho House, and now the new Kepler building just be behind us down the hill. Uh, but we also have a quite a big facility in Seven Oaks, which focuses on optical engineering, does all the cameras and instruments for optical payloads. We have a, uh, also quite a large in volume uh, facility at Borden uh, in Hampshire, not very far from here, which focuses on composites. So we have a composite manufacturing facility there for our spacecraft structures. And we have a new office out in Denver in the US, uh, SSTUS, which is now about 15, uh, 15 folk. And the whole idea of SSTL is to exploit the research that comes out of the Surrey Space Centre research team and to apply that to real operational missions. And so the combination of the academic research in the Surrey Space Centre and the commercial exploitation in uh, SSTL is really a very powerful synergy of, of these two ingredients. So let's have a quick look at uh, what goes on in the, in the Surrey Space Centre. Now this, this <clears throat> presentation will be available to you, so you don't have to make notes on all, the, all the, uh, the list of activities, but it's just to give you a flavour of the range of activities that's being carried out by the 100 folk over in the, in the Space Centre. Everything looking at from planetary environments through to navigation, remote sensing, uh, AI and biomimetrics. <clears throat> so let's have a quick look at some of those in a little bit more detail. In robotic exploration, uh, the thing that we're specialising on here is, is mimicking what we see in the natural world, and a very good example <coughs> is how do we try to address the problem of how we drill into an asteroid when there's very little gravity, and so if you take your electric drill and try and drill into it, all you do is whiz around, and the asteroid stays still. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, looking to see how we can drill into that by using, taking the example of the wood wasp, which has a, a rather uh, neat way of laying its eggs into wood without it spinning around, 
uh, and it has a sort of ratcheting uh, mechanism, and we've mimicked that uh, to use that for planetary exploration. There's a whole range of other activities in the robotic group, including uh, uh, autonomous uh, formation flying uh, and uh, pinpoint landing using optic flow type techniques to assess landing sites on, on planets. The team in Earth Observation and Space Science, again, has a very wide range of activities. It look, from GPS reflectometry to taking advantage of the uh, GPS signals, or GLONASS, or GNSS to be precise, I suppose, all the navigation signals that are bathing the surface of the Earth, looking at the reflections off the surface of the sea, and using that to, to uh, determine the ocean roughness, and hence wave heights, and provide that as information from shipping. At the other end, looking at ozone uh, depletion, uh, early emissions, still using the, analyzing the data from the FASAT mission, looking at uh, ozone depletion in the southern hemisphere. And uh, more recently, as you will hear, looking at uh, radar techniques. The group on astrodynamics looks at micropropulsion, uh, formation flying, and also uh, uh, how we will manage eventually uh, the swarms of uh, satellites on a chip that, uh, uh, that we're aiming towards. The group on space vehicle control is looking at all the aspects of uh, satellite dynamics and stability. And as you see, we're getting in higher and higher resolution satellites. So some of the aspects of uh, pointing uh, and uh, trembling or rumble or jitter become very critical. And so looking at how we control that is, uh, uh, again, an area of uh, work there. And at the same time, that group extends out to looking at uh, uh, things like solar sailing as well. So a very wide range of activities. Communications, looking at uh, smart antennas, uh, distributed, uh, linking that together with onboard data handling systems so that we can have uh, Wi-Fi networks of the uh, uh, swarms of uh, satellites on a chip in the future. And of course, <clears throat> as an example of this, although it's now 10 years ago, uh, the uh, Space Center together with SSTL built the SNAP uh, nano satellite, again about uh, six kilos, uh, and we used that uh, to, uh, as a test bed for a lot of the technologies uh, for in-orbit inspection, uh, propulsion, and uh, navigation uh, that we're now using on some of our current uh, missions and uh, some of the future ones as well. And this, of course, is leading on to today. What do we, uh, what do we have? Uh, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that from my colleague Sean later on uh, today. Uh, is uh, the Strand nanosatellite. Uh, this is uh, the, the sort of follow-on, essentially, from SNAP using the... Uh, the gizzards, if you like, of a smartphone, which contains nearly all the technology we need uh, for uh, the satellite avionics, um, to use the heart of that uh, as the basis for the next generation of very tiny uh, spacecraft. I'm not going to say any more from that because uh, Sean is going to discuss that in, in more detail. Another exciting uh, project we have, which Susan is going to talk to uh, uh, in a few moments, is... Uh, a project which involves a wide range of universities across ESA, member and cooperating states, to launch a satellite uh, around the moon. And I'm not going to steal any more of uh, Susan's thunder and let her talk about that later. So, what's on the horizon? Well, you, there's a lot of controversy about the Space Web, uh, James uh, Webb Space Telescope, whether it's going to be cancelled or not as the uh, successor to Hubble. Um, however, we're looking beyond that. Uh, even if that uh, mission does fly. Because this is about the largest spacecraft that's possible to launch in terms of uh, a, uh, uh, a single mirrored spacecraft. The mirrors itself is made up out of individual segments, but it's actually launched as one entity. And to go to the next generation, where we want look for satellites you know, or uh, telescopes even twice or three times the size, is going to be physically impossible. So part of the uh, work that the Space Center is doing in conjunction with Caltech and JPL in the States is to look at how can we assemble autonomously and robotically in orbit uh, a, a large mirror telescope out of small uh, ingredients. So here is the example. This is going to be the proof of concept mission where we take uh, uh, seven spacecraft, a mothership and six smaller spacecraft, each carrying optical mirrors. We launch them together. Then we assemble them in orbit into the shape you might see in the middle. So you might have a nice typically round mirror. Uh, then integrate uh, uh, those onto the, the, the focal plane. 
Uh, but not only that, we may want to decide that, okay, for some applications we want to have maximum signal to noise, so we would have a, a, a conventional shaped uh, assembly. On others, we might want to have uh, discrimination or uh, resolution rather than signal to noise, and we will then do undock the, the spacecraft and uh, uh, reconnect them in, the, in what you see over here on the right, a long, thin spacecraft to give us increased resolution but slightly reduced signal to noise. And this is going to be a demonstration mission just to show that we can assemble, in the end, a much, much larger system, uh, which we can then reconfigure uh, depending on the uh, applications. So these are some of the things that are going on in the Space Center. So now, very quickly, what's happening at SSTL since uh, we last were here? Well, I think you will probably remember uh, we launched about five years ago uh, a series of spacecraft in the disaster monitoring constellation. This one is uh, uh, Beijing 1, which provides uh, four-meter imaging from, uh, uh, from its uh, onboard telescopes as part of the DMC. We also launched TopSat, which uh, provides 2.5-meter imaging. And here is an example of Washington. The red arrow in the left is the Pentagon. Whoops, let's go back, if that's at all possible here. Yeah. Uh, the red arrow in the left is the Pentagon. The one in the middle is showing the Washington Memorial. And the one on the right is the White House. So this was uh, two and a half meters uh, imaging from a spacecraft, which is about the size, actually, of this podium. Um, and these uh, satellites have been in orbit, and that's the sort of the current state of the art. But uh, to be launched now on uh, August the 17th, and uh, we should be heading out to uh, Yazny, the launch site in, uh, in Russia, for a launch on uh, Dnieper, uh, will be the latest spacecraft, which uh, has uh, been in storage now for about nine months, awaiting the, the launch. Uh, for Nigeria. Two satellites will be launched. Uh, this one, which is called Nigeria Sat 2, if I could spell it right, not the heading, and uh, a second one, which is a smaller experimental satellite, which is called NX. Nigeria Sat 2 is going to be a really complex spacecraft in terms of small Earth operation uh, observation systems. It's also relatively big for us. I mean, if I stand on it, I, my uh, you know, thinning hair is just about on the uh, level with the top of the spacecraft. So this is uh, a satellite I can't put my arms around for the first time. Get an idea of what's, in, uh, what's inside. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> try hard. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a very complex, agile spacecraft, with a, and you can get the, an idea of the size of the telescope uh, in the bottom right, the gold-colored uh, thing. So this will be launched uh, uh, from Dnieper in uh, about two, a bit over two weeks' time, hopefully. We've been having a long discussion. It was delayed for uh, many, many months because, first of all, the drop zones of Dnepr weren't agreed with Kazakhstan. And then once those were agreed, uh, there was a disagreement between uh, Cosmotras and the Russian military about who's going to pay for the fuel. And uh, that has rumbled on for months, but uh, um, two days ago it was finally solved. But we're m working on also higher resolution satellites. Uh, the next generation is going to be one meter imaging. Uh, and we've currently got under construction three spacecraft to provide a constellation with uh, one meter imaging. And this is not only a, a new um, technology development, because it's really challenging. When you go from four to two to one, it doesn't sound much, but actually if you think of it, it's going up at the square. You know, all the problems are going up with the square of the difference. So uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a real challenge to produce high quality one meter imaging on small spacecraft. Um, but these, are, these three satellites are going to be uh, launched into orbit. We're going to uh, fund and operate them uh, and own them. And we're going to then lease the, the uh, uh, imaging capacity once in orbit. And this is something that's very familiar in the geostationary world where you rent a transponder by the hour. But generally speaking, in Earth observation, you buy your satellite and then you operate it. And then you have people who distribute the data and you buy the data from them. So we're not only looking at how we can uh, increase the technology, but also the business model. And uh, surprisingly, the, the Chinese spotted this as a really interesting uh, way of doing business. And they've already bought 100% of the capacity of the first three spacecraft. So we're very pleased with that, of course, because that means we can go ahead uh, comfortably. Uh, and hopefully, we'll add more satellites uh, to it in the, in the future. Now, we're not only working on optical systems. We have, for, probably may, some of you have been here for a while, may even remember some presentations way back on radar uh, techniques. We've been working, and this is where our 
Uh, own, uh, our parents, uh, Astrium, have uh, brought a benefit because we've had some teams with some expertise from EADS working with uh, folk here at the Space Center to build up a prototype uh, uh, radar system for a small synthetic aperture radar satellite. This payload has been flown on a, a slightly shaky aircraft uh, <clears throat> and that has been used to demonstrate the uh, uh, multipolarmetric imaging, uh, radar imaging on the ground. And you can see a couple of examples um, on the, uh, the bottom left. And then we took a very small section of the radar and pointed it up at the space station. Now this is, as I say, only a fraction of the, the overall radar uh, uh, antenna. So um, the uh, performance of this is, is, is not as anything like as good as we would expect from the full system. But then in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see an example where we were imaging the space station, International Space Station, here from the ground, just to demonstrate that actually it works over those sort of distances as well as the flying it from an aircraft. So what we want to do is, over the next uh, four or five years, is to do for radar what we've done for, Earth, uh, for optical imaging. You'll also remember a few years ago that, uh, well actually now six years ago, time flies, that we launched uh, GOVA, the first satellite. This was not a small satellite physically for us, it was the biggest thing we've ever built. It weighed 600 kilos and it stretched 11 meters tip to tip. And one of the reasons why we're now building the, or have built the new Kepler building. This uh, uh, system has now been in operation and we're now building down in the new building 14 uh, satellites, uh, the payloads are being built here at Surrey, the platforms in, uh, with our colleagues in Germany and OHB, and we're going to be integrating those together ready for launch in, uh, in um, uh, 2014. If we get a chance to have a look around the, the, uh, the new Kepler building, you'll see first of all we have clean rooms now that can accommodate this, but we also have manufacturing facilities including automatic pick and place and, uh, and other <coughs> quite fancy assembly techniques because for this particular system, we have to build 400 units, uh, various uh, re uh, remote terminal units and so forth. We're now talking about large numbers of space qualified uh, units. So now we have automated our facilities so that we can uh, cope with those large uh, throughputs and also provide rapid response and high quality for even single units. And <coughs> uh, we are also uh, working on uh, small geostationary spacecraft. And I think we have also mentioned this before, but just recently, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I'm not sure whether it's the Gang of Four, uh, but myself, uh, Dr. Perry Klein, Carl Mainzer, and Jan King uh, have uh, been uh, putting a proposal to see whether we can uh, reinvigorate the original uh, <coughs> 1971 Syncart uh, proposal, uh, the synchronous amateur radio transponder, uh, which was proposed uh, 40 years ago, uh, but has yet to, to find a, a suitable flight, whether we could do it as a hosted payload on uh, some commercial satellites or uh, whether we can be able to incorporate it on one of our first uh, test flights of the, of the Surrey geostationary satellite. So watch this space because I think you will learn a little bit more about that. We also <clears throat> need to push innovation, and so the UK, with the new UK Space Agency, is funding a uh, UK technology demonstration satellite, called Tech DemoSat for short, uh, and this is uh, being led here from Surrey, but is involving a whole range of other companies and institutions around the UK. And the objective is just to put new technologies on and just find out how they work in orbit so that we can then use them on later operational missions. So that's a very quick picture of what we've been doing here at Surrey over the last year or two. Um, and uh, I hope we'll have, say, have an opportunity to, to take you and have a look around the Kepler building for those that are interested just down the hill, uh, our new uh, assembly integration manufacturing facilities, um, perhaps sometime just before dinner or some suitable uh, break point. So with that, Dave, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. And uh, hand over to Dave for the next one. Okay.